Okay, welcome. I see our attendees joining us. Welcome, welcome. Welcome everyone to the eighth edition of the annual memorial lecture hosted by the Olashegun Agagu Foundation. We are happy to have you all here. Welcome, get settled. It's going to be an excellent day, an excellent program, excellent evening for those of us in Nigeria, for those of us in the US and in different parts of the world, it may be morning. Uh, it may be very early morning. It may be very late at night, but we are happy to have you all here. Welcome, welcome. Um, say hello, Agagu family. We're all here live from, from Lagos. I'm here from Brooklyn, New York, uh, but my spirit is in Lagos with all of you sitting, sitting here at this table. Um, so again, welcome to the eighth annual Memorial Lecture. So as we settle in, oh, Agagu family, would you like to say hello? We hear you in the background. <laughs> no? Okay, hi, hello, hello. Hello, family, hello, hello. Um, so yes, welcome. And um, as we get settled, I'm going to make some quick introductions, remind us all why we are here, okay? So um, as you all know, this memorial lecture is to honor the late uh, Olushegun Agagu, uh, a brilliant statesman, entrepreneur, father, husband, um, and we're all here today to honor his legacy. And today we are going to be talking specifically about entrepreneurship, the intergenerational approach to building wealth, uh, a topic which I'm very excited about today. Um, and we're going to learn all about the foundation, the foundation's work, and also find out ways that we can all support. Uh, it's very, very important today that we think about how can we all contribute to building the legacy of this wonderful, wonderful man um, and supporting the family that works tirelessly to do so. Um, so thank you again for having me. I am excited because this is now officially my fourth uh, annual lecture. So um, I attended the first one in 2018 with Her Excellency Dr. Joyce Banda, and then again in 2019 in person with Her Excellency Amina Garib Fakim from Mauritius. And last year we were honored to support the family to take it online because we're in those times now where things are online. Um, and now again this year, uh, it's really an honor to be here and thank you on behalf of me and all of my team at Baobab Consulting for trusting us uh, with today's lecture. So without further ado, I'm going to kick it off by introducing the uh, Gagu Foundation Chairman, Dr. Deji Adeleke, who is going to present uh, the foundation, the activities, uh, and kick us off today. So um, please uh, feel free to share your screen and I'm going to project um, some slides that, we, that he will be presenting. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. All right, welcome, welcome. Okay, and now here we are. Yeah, Gagu, Olusha Gagu Foundation was founded in 2014 after the passing of our dear brother, husband, father, and an extraordinary administrator and a, and a nation builder in, in, when, after his passing. And um, the foundation was founded to immortalize the name of, the, of uh, and, and also to carry on his, the legacy of the late Ulushe Gagu. Um, And to live up to seek and articulate his personal credo, which was to leave things better than he made them. Further, the, the ideals he lived by and worked passionately towards, particularly intellectual excellence, good governance, 
and national development about our foundation. Our focal areas are academia, geology, petroleum engineering, energy, pol politics, slash good governance, culture and arts, especially high life music, service, and aviation. Our board of trustees comprises Chief Pius Aki Elure, Mrs. Maria Epere, Prince Yomi Adefulu, MFR, Alaji Kazim Imam, Mrs. Sholakwe Adefala, Dr. Lumu Iwa Aliu, Mr. Femi Agagu, Mr. Feyi Agagu, Mr. Akin Aru Ajoye, and Mr. Mr. Kaode, follower, and myself, the Jadiliki, as, as, as chairman. Our activities over the years, the foundation has carried out the following activities. Uh, seven memorial lecture events organized, held each year on the anniversary of the passing of our dear Dr. Lusha Gungagagu. Existing bursary and cash prize programs for university students maintained more than 200 awards and prizes so far. Several new cash prizes and school scholarship established at secondary school levels, undergraduate and master's degree program levels. 67 of these awards, 67 of these awarded over the past year, 2020 slash 2021 academic year. Over 200 recipients since inception, 50 more to be added from now on, from now on. Our impact so far, in summary, 200 plus scholarships, prize recipients across secondary and tertiary inst institutions. Graduate prizes, 8 million Naira. Uh, and and we, we are in, part, in partnership with six universities, including University of Ibadan, Universities of, and, and, and University of Ibadan, the Premier College, Adelike University, Aos Tech, Adekule Ajasin University, and FUTA. I believe FUTA is Federal University of Technology, Akure. And our five plus field of study, scholarships and prizes were awarded to undergraduate and graduate students in various fields of study with the focal, with, with, with the focus on STEM courses. I think STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and, math and mathematics. Our future initiatives, scholarship and award, awards, uh, awards programs, award, awards program. Uh, to add a, a, a university every year to the to the scheme by giving an endowment, endowment for three students per university in geology or petroleum engineering to increase the value of endowment at existing universities or increase the number of scholarship awards. A compendium. <laughs> A compendium of speeches from all our great al al alumni speakers and the policy papers that have come out as a result. Memorial Library, a library digital slash or physical <clears throat> in memory of Dr. Lushegu Agagu to educate the public as well as promote the work of the foundation. Other initiatives. 
essay research paper competitions, volunteer teaching and mentoring, and intervention in aviation and safety. Our thanks. We thank everyone who has supported the initiative and enabled these good works to continue. Together, we hope that we can continue to do more to leave things better than we made them. Thank you very, very much. And we are looking forward to a very robust uh, presentation from our panelists and on, on the topic entrepreneurship, intergenerational approaches to building wealth. And um, this, this is a vast area that cannot even be fully exhausted in, in, you know, in one event. In, uh, it is going to take almost more, you know, more than a day to be able to cover the areas that this uh, topic can cover so that we can encourage young entrepreneurs that are you know, coming on. Um, I'm, I'm happy that a lot of our young entrepreneurs in the area of FinTech in Nigeria are now assessing um, venture capitals from, uh, you know, and attracting venture capitals from, you know, outside Nigeria, and, you know, especially from the United States. And um, these are some of the things that we are lacking when we started, you know, because as, uh, as an entrepreneur myself, it was, it was not very easy to, to raise capital, because that was the main thing, because like access to credit and capital equaled uh, what was key to uh, wealth building, you know, when we started. But now, luckily, at least, at least in the area of, you know, FinTech, Nigerians are now accessing uh, venture capital. And that is the reason why it seems that the United States is the uh, laboratory of, you know, entrepreneurs because they have access to venture capital that yeah. others they does not have. And we're, we're looking forward to you. you know getting more from our panelists. Thank you very much. And Thank God bless you. all of you for attending. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. It's it's really, uh, thank you so much for the presentation and for explaining what the Agagu Foundation has accomplished so far. I'm very excited based off of what you're talking about, the importance of venture capital, the importance of investing in entrepreneurs. Um, and I'm really excited for our conversation later. We have, uh, today we have Almaz Nagash, who's going to be speaking to us from the African Diaspora Network and her organization connects African entrepreneurs with Silicon Valley resources, uh, such as investors and accelerators. And then we're going to be hearing from some um, of the most successful entrepreneurs um, that Africa has produced as well. So really, we're very, very excited. Um, and thank you so much for that presentation. Um, as my, my role as MC today, I'm going to be guiding you through the program. Um, I'm also going to be reminding you um, of some things, for example, like questions. Um, we have a Q&A feature uh, down at the bottom of your Zoom. So if you have any questions, whether it's about the Agagu Foundation and their activities, whether it's for the speakers, um, any questions, please use the chat and the Q&A um, to, to ask those, and we'll make sure to get those answered. Um, the other thing I want to remind everyone of is that, you know, um, the family sitting in front of us today um, has really, really dedicated a lot of their time and resources to doing good work in the name of their father. Uh, they can't do it alone. Uh, we really, really need your support today um, to, to donate, to support any, any opportunities. Uh, resources that you have that you can share to contribute to this mission of leaving the world better than we found it, um, please do get uh, in touch with us. Um, so um, I will thank all of you. And what we're going to do now um, is have a brief moment of silence um, 
in memorial of uh, the late uh, the late Agag Agagu. So please, if we can all stand, thank you. Um, and we will do a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay. So, um, wonderful. So, um, I think we are waiting to confirm if our last panelist has arrived. Um, so, in the meantime, um, what we can do is um, Excuse me, can I just get confirmation um, if our last panelist has arrived? I don't believe so. Um, okay, great. I'm reading a lot of these, uh, uh, I'm reading a lot of people who are, who are giving some wonderful testimonials um, of, of the late Dr. Oloshegu Nagagu. This is amazing. Looking in the chat um, is, is great, is great to, to see. Okay, so let me begin um, by introducing the panelists who are here and who are, um, who are here already. So first, our moderator today is Adenike Adeyeme, and I will let uh, Adenike, I'm going to let you do the honor of introducing the bios and the accomplishments of our panelists today. But on our panel, um, we have Almaz Negash, who is the founder and executive director of the African Diaspora Network. And we have Odun Aweni, Awe who is um, the co-founder of PiggyVest, which is one of the most successful companies that the continent has seen. So I will allow, um, I will allow you all to join us uh, on your cameras um, while we wait uh, for, our, for our next panelist. But I'm going to pass the mic to you, Adenike, as our distinguished moderator of the panel today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon once again to members of the Agago family and all our guests who are watching in live and in person. I'm really honored to be the moderator for today's session and particularly to talk about a, a topic that was very, very dear uh, to Dr. Agago's heart. It's very dear to his family and lives on in his children and a lot of the work that he has done. And, and also to host this conversation with amazing entrepreneurs who are in their different ways and unique ways building wealth, connecting people with wealth and resources. And today's conversation is around the topic of um, entrepreneurship and intergenerational approaches to building wealth. Um, the first speaker, which I would like to introduce is uh, none other uh, than Alma, Almaz Nagesh, uh, who is the founder and executive director of the African Diaspora Network. Uh, she's a recognized thought leader. She's well sought after on the topic of entrepreneurship, innovation, investment, and through over, um, she's had over 25 years of experience um, in international trade, business management, and social innovation, building successful partnerships uh, with major stakeholders in across the diaspora, um, in academic institutions with 500, Fortune 500 companies uh, within the US and around the world. Um, about 11 years ago, she founded the African Diaspora Network to inform and engage Africans in the diaspora and help to facilitate their collaboration with social entrepreneurs, innovators, and business leaders. Um, ADN, under her leadership, has been able to produce leading and convening conversations within um, and about the African innovation ecosystem in Silicon Valley um, and the Africa Diaspora Investment Symposium. 
which has brought together over 5,000 people from around the world. ADN also has uh, developed and implements two uh, entrepreneurship and leader accelerator programs uh, called the Builders of African Future and Accelerating Black Leadership. She's currently fundraising and developing strategies to provide access to capital to black entrepreneurs and innovators. You're welcome once again, Alma. Thank you. Thank you. Our second speaker for today is none other than Odun Ayo Ewenini. Odu is the co-founder of Piggy Vest, and I must say she's one of those people that we see our products daily on my on, on our phones. I definitely am one person who used Piggy Vest to recently save um, and do a major renovation in my dad's house in Nevada. So she's someone that our product speaks up, have the business that she's built and founded really has, has really impacted a lot of lives. She's the co-founder and chief operations officer for Piggyvest, which is the largest digital and investment platform in Nigeria. And prior to founding Piggyvest, she founded Push CV, which is the largest job site in Africa, and also has one of the largest database for pre-screened candidates. Um, she's an award-winning fintech entrepreneur who is working for diversity, equity, and inclusion in fintech and in technology as a whole. Um, as the CEO of Piggyvest, she oversees finance, investment management, people operations, investor relations, fundraising, and other sub-related categories. In 2021, so in January 2021, earlier this year, Odu co-founded First Check Africa, which is a female-led angel fund that invests ridiculously early in women in African tech. And we, if we know the abysmal numbers, <laughs> Um, for growth stage funding for women-led businesses, and, and not just in tech, but across all sectors, we know that this is a very important initiative. And the focus of First Tech Africa is to make it easier for, for women to raise venture-backed capital and invest in technology uh, startups. She's also a member of uh, various boards and initiatives, including Village Capital, and has been featured on several platforms and, and, um, and a lot of award-winning lists, including Bloomberg's Business Weekly's 2020 Bloomberg 50 list, um, 2021 Time 100 Next Honorary, uh, one of Forbes Africa 30 Under 30 in Tech in 2019, and one of 30 Quartz Africa Innovators of 2019. You're very much welcome, Odo. Just confirming that Odo is okay. Yes, great. And um, our third speaker, who I will introduce, and we'll just start with him once he comes, um, is Inye Aboyeji, uh, who is fondly called E. E is the general partner and co founder of Future Africa, which is a platform that provides capital, coaching, and community for mission driven innovators who are building an African future where purpose and prosperity is within everyone's reach. Prior to find, founding Future Africa, he previously worked as a Deputy Director General for the Madame Obi Ezekwesi 2019 presidential campaign. Um, he has also helped to build Andela and Flutterwave, which are two of Africa's largest and fastest growing technology companies backed by global investors. He is a World Economic Forum global leader and sits on a number of local and international corporate and non-profit organization focused on how to support high growth innovation driven entrepreneurs and enterprises in their domains. So we will, we welcome E in advance of him coming to this session. So great. Uh, thank you once again, um, ladies for joining the session and we're very happy to have this conversation with you. Um, I would first of all like to ask uh, two questions and I'll start with Almaz. Um, how did you start your entrepreneurial journey? A very simple question, but how did you start your entrepreneurial journey? Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, especially to the family for the honor. And I'm very delighted to be a part of this very important discussion. And when it comes to Nigeria and Nigerians, they don't have any more champion than I am. Um, I'm a very champion of Nigerians all around. Um, I started, um, you know, I, I am uh, an immigrant uh, from Eritrea. I came as a foreign student, left home after high school. Uh, just like many other Africans, I left home because there was a war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, which doesn't seem to stop anyway. Um, 
Then I went to study in Holland and made my journey to the United States, um, studied at a Jesuit university in San Francisco, uh, got my bachelor's degree, then eventually I got my master's degree. Throughout all this time, I was always interested, uh, not just in the uh, entrepreneurship itself, but what can you do to make a, a difference in the community? So I started uh, working at the World Trade Center, Bay Area World Trade Center in San Francisco that helped me to um, help small and medium-sized companies to export and import. And I was able to really get them into Africa, uh, Europe, uh, and Asian markets. That was a wonderful eye opener. And so that was a journey, but it's still at the same time, I'm actually doing everything I know how to do to make sure that these SMEs were successful. Throughout that venture for about 11 years, um, I continued to live in the Bay Area, I never left the Bay Area. I came as a foreign student. I'm still here as a mother of two children, married for 27 years. I don't think I'll go anywhere. And that really ecosystem of Silicon Valley nurtured me to continue to have these aspirations and, um, and dreams to make a difference in myself, my family, and my community, which then really got me into higher school, higher education. And that also was very, very helpful. Uh, eventually, I became uh, annoyed uh, by uh, people talking about Africa without Africans at the table. And that was when I started 2011, I just decided, you know, instead of being always unhappy with what people do, uh, why not we create our own uh, space uh, where we can actually invite others to join us. And that's what African Diaspora uh, Network does. We invite people. Uh, I'm very proud and happy to say that we started as an idea 11 years ago today. We're about to launch the seventh annual African Diaspora Investment Symposium, where Liz and many of you, including E, uh, who I'm happy to see him here, has invested when we had no money into it. So I'm always appreciative of that support. So when I said I am the champion of Nigerians, you know why I am champion of Nigerians. Um, Nigeria is a big uh, country. We'll talk about it. But I, I, I think that once you get into the space that we're in with the African Diaspora Network, you know to who can make a difference. And I think I probably started going to my Nigerian friends in Silicon Valley uh, to make things happen. So I think that's my journey, but uh, just in a brief way, and we'll talk uh, details uh, more as we go. Thank you. Thank you. I know I, know I asked the question of about two decades and you man you've managed to really summarize it. Thank you very much. Um, we'll be taking questions. Um, so please put your questions in the Q&A uh, feature in your Zoom platform and uh, we'll take them when we get to the Q&A segment. And once, please do let me know if once he joins and so that I can also ask, uh, ask him the question. He's Thank here. you, Ahmad. Oh, great. You're welcome, E. You're welcome. Great to see you. Thank you. I apologize for joining a little late. Just, it's okay. Uh, you're you're right on time. <laughs> That's fine. We've introduced Thank you, so you're welcome. Thank you. Um, so, Adu, I'd like to go to you next. You know, Almas talked about um, starting our entrepreneurial journey within the Bay Area. And one of the things people always talk about is the role of education and just being in a community of knowledge and learning that can also help to facilitate um, ideas and innovation and all of that. So although you schooled in Nigeria, and a lot of times you always look down on Nigerian universities, um, what, what, if any, um, was the role of your educational background <coughs> in your entrepreneurial journey? And, and so I'm asking you two questions at once, so please bear with me. What, if any, was the role of your educational background, particularly in Nigeria, in your entrepreneurial journey, that's number one. Number two, what do you think the role of the education space can be on entrepreneurial journey, particularly for young people who are starting out? Thank you. All right, hi everyone. Sorry, I'm, I'm struggling with my voice today, so please bear with me. Um, so I went to Covenant University and I did attend it along with both my co-founders. And one of the most important things that we learned from Covenant was the role of self-teaching, even as you're kind of going to class. I will say that of most, most of the schools in Nigeria, Covenant and maybe a few others present like some of the best environments to encourage young people to kind of get together and build things outside of the academic curriculum. 
I studied computer engineering and my co-founders were in engineering courses as well, but I spent a bit, quite a bit of my time in the school library and just reading books that had absolutely nothing to do with computer engineering. And so um, a lot of that was also informed by the fact that both my parents are university professors. So from a very young age, they were very about, you need to learn things outside of your sphere of interest. You need to broaden your horizons. And to link to your second question, that's what's missing in the Nigerian educational system, broadening of horizons. Our curriculum hasn't changed. Uh, our scheme of work is still the same. People are still learning the same things that people have been learning since. I always make this joke. I studied computer engineering from 2008 to 2013. And my brother went in to study computer engineering in 2018, I think. And I could give him my class notes and he was fine. And so that represents a challenge because what we know to be true in 2008 as it relates to tech is definitely different than 2013. It's different than today. Last month in technology is wildly different than today in technology. So education as a, as, a, as, as a whole, like as an entity, has quite a bit to teach young people, right? We've seen Nigerian graduates like at the baseline, communication is missing. Proper like CV writing is missing. Basic computer knowledge is missing. We have so many fundamental problems when it comes to education that entrepreneurship as a thing is almost somehow the least of our worries because those problems, they, they, they almost go unsolved, right? You look at schools like OAU, Covenant, Babcock, what are they doing different? The thing that they are doing different is that the students themselves are having to wake up and decide, I must do better for myself outside of this curriculum and then doing it. If and we can continue that way and we keep getting outliers and one or two or three successful people or as a country, we can look at why and what are people learning? Why are they different, right? Why is Shola of Pestang different? Why is GB of Flutterwim different? Why is everyone who happens to be running this tech company different? Why did they drop out of Unilag, for instance? You know, why are they not finishing? And picking up elements of that, marrying it into what we are actually teaching kids in school so that we can produce better quality people. Um, a small example was during the pandemic, my, my youngest uh, sister was locked in with us, she was locked down with us. And we were teaching her like her, her subjects. And I randomly asked her one day, she uses an iPad to study, who is the founder of Apple? And she didn't know, she's 10. And so from that day, it was, it was like kind of a shock to us, like use an iPad every day, she has an iPhone and all of these Apple products, but zero knowledge of the world that built that. And so what we did was we limited her school lectures, please don't report us, to 8 to 12, and did 12 to 2 of just general knowledge. And she's been better for it. I've seen other kids just kind of be homeschooled and people finding a balance, and they're better for it. So there has to be a way to marry it. We cannot properly, like, fully jettison what we're currently learning, but we do need to improve it. Schools are still teaching C++ and Visual Basic. There are no real life coders using those languages today. And so I think that like, there is a gap between what we're learning in school and where the world is at. And we definitely need to bridge that gap. Um, private sector can't do it alone. And Della can't, Talent QL can't. We need social intervention to be able to do it at scale so that we're producing several aims in one set instead of one in 10 years. Thank you very much, Otto. You've talked about really just institutional change across board, um, curriculum change, but also making it relevant and very practical. Um, I know you're you're talking about computer science. If you can, if you now imagine like a course like mine, I did linguistics in UI. We were doing 1970s, um, whatever. So and, and computer science is even typically more advanced than some of the other courses. And I believe we have quite a lot of people here who are also on this conversation, who really are stakeholders within uh, the tertiary university, the tertiary institution space in Nigeria, who, who, who are, I'm sure, also working on this. 
E, my next question will go to you. And one of the, so when Odo was giving her example, um, as she was talking about her sister, you know, because her sister has her and others around her, um, her part, the pathway for her sister will probably be different in terms of her view of entrepreneurship or even just opportunities across board. Um, and so my question will be around how do we showcase the stories of the different opportunities and pathways for entrepreneurship? Uh, one of the things people ask sometimes is that oh, is the, 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 the entrepreneurship is not like a fancy thing. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. You look at every, every uh, job title on LinkedIn and it's CEO, founder and all of that. And then everybody wants to be not just an entrepreneur, but a tech entrepreneur. Um, what are the opportunities as we have this conversation around building wealth and entrepreneurship? Um, how do we show and talk about the different stories and the expression? of entrepreneurship um, so that people just sort of see different opportunities um, regardless of whatever environments they are or the circumstances or, or, the, or, the, or, or whatever circumstances that they are. Let me put it like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I think when we think and talk about entrepreneurship, it's always helpful to come back to what is at its core, which is not just starting a company, but creating incredible value and then, and then devising a way to capture a piece of it. And there are many roles for people who can, who have the skills or who build the skills to create value um, for, for society, right? And um, for, you know, thinking about entrepreneurship first um, as a social mission, um, to help us to actually really expand on the possibilities when we're talking about um, what is possible with entrepreneurship. And there are many parts there, you know, it kind of livens up and opens up when we think about entrepreneurship as creating and capturing value um, so that we can make people's lives better. Um, so for example, there's um, a dearth of academic research about some of our problems as a society. Um, I remember my first en engagement with an entrepreneur was a guy called David Sheraton, who was um, a professor of computer science in my university. And, this gentleman had funded Google and he actually basically donated to build the computer science building. One would have thought he would have been an entrepreneur. Um, and we had quite a number in my school, like, um, like um, you know, the founders of BlackBerry, Mike Lazaridis and many others. But this was one of the most inspiring characters because it was a professor who had engaged in some research and because of his foresight, and encouraged one of his students to leverage his patents and build something new and contributed back to society. And there are other pathways like being an operator. Um, a lot of companies now are in dire need of people who can help them build and scale up their operations and help them bring some discipline um, to what is um, now uh, a repeatable um, process of uh, creating value that they've discovered. Um, and they, they're not finding those people because um, you know, everybody thinks you just have to be, the only way to be wealthy as an entrepreneur is to find C, is to be CEO and founder. Um, but for us to come to a realization of what is possible, um, we do have to adopt some shared values that I think are foundational to entrepreneurship as a culture. And that's thinking about it very differently from a role for a founder, because rarely ever is a company ever founded by one person. It doesn't, you know, matter um, how big the company is or how famous you can't, it's not the work of one person, it's a team sport. And that is, you know, a willingness to share value across board. Um, and that's something that's missing in our culture. Um, a lot of our culture promotes this idea that the spoils of entrepreneurship have to accrue to one person. Um, otherwise, they're not real spoils. Um, and there isn't a sense of um, mission, there isn't a sense of shared value and, and shared reward. Um, and, and these are things that we need to start fixing in the way we think about entrepreneurship and what it's for. It's not, entrepreneurship is not a ministry for the glorification of the founder. Um, it, is, it is supposed to be a service uh, to the world uh, by creating um, solutions to problems and in that process, creating value and capturing value. So I think once those values around entrepreneurship change, um, and it's gonna take all of us to do that, you're going to start to see a shift towards other kinds of engagement uh, in this respect. 
Thank you, E. So entrepreneurship is a service that we give that creates solutions to the world. Thank you. That's uh, quite profound. Um, Almaz, I'd like to come back to you. And um, you, you, you've, you, you've worked and you are working uh, across different continents and also across different generations. Um, are there any differences that you see in terms of approaches to building businesses um, now in the current generation and also looking back maybe about two to three uh, decades ago? And if yes, please, can you provide perspectives for to us on, on that? So, uh, no, thank you. I think um, he said something that's very important at its core. Whether you started the business 30 years ago or today, anything that we do has to be aligned to our value. Not just only your own personal value, but the shared value of a community. To be a leader, you have to have people following you. They believe in, in, that, in that mission, not necessarily the leader, but the organization. You know, almost all the time, I always say, we go back and forth. The organization stays. So I would leave ADN at some point, but my work is really how do I sustain this organization to create the value that's necessary so that generations from now, people will have actually access to the resources and the needs that they have. So I think almost everything we do, whether we started it 30 years ago, those who have lasted, you know, um, um, the, the companies and uh, uh, organizations, enterprises that lasted long, have actually had something in common around all of them. Um, and that is value. They had a value and they had a purpose for what they were doing. It wasn't about the leader. It was about the bigger picture. It's something that's much bigger than us. And so to cultivate that and to make that possible, you really have to align with what is needed in the community and how do you make it possible to give it to the people. If you don't create value, you can have as many titles as you want. It doesn't mean anything. But if what you do is creation of value that people can use and really better themselves. In this case, um, I will talk about why the diaspora and why the continent. Many people have started, um, I'm sure they've talked about diaspora um, for many years. So I'm going to use this as an example. But when I was looking at diaspora, I was actually not looking at Africans who have done a big diaspora network. I was looking at the Jewish community and the Irish community, especially in the United States. If you look at these two communities, you would be amazed at the amount of work they have put behind it. And then of course the Indian community, that's the latter one. But the first two, the Jewish and the Irish community, the diaspora have done incredibly to mobilize resources and go give back to their own community. Irish are known for this. They have really saved the country so many times. And if you ask them, why did they do this? The diasporans, if the Irish diaspora, it's the heritage. Now, in the, in the context of Africa, it is not that easy. I'm talking about 54 to 55 countries, which makes it much more complex. But what I always tell people is not just that we have to have that name diaspora necessarily, I think it's the community as a whole. Who wants to be part of the change that we wish to see in the continent? Is it that I work only because I am from Eritrea with Eritreans? Well, there are diaspora organizations, Nigerian diaspora organizations are very, very well known everywhere they go, simply because we have 200 million Nigerians. And you can imagine by that year, you have more immigrants coming to many different places, including the United States. There's another characteristics of Nigerians they are highly educated, the same level as South Africans in that level, you know, because South Africans have also been coming, but that doesn't mean it's all, uh, it's, it's a very diverse community from South Africa. From Nigeria is also a diverse community from different regions, different ethnic background, and still represent the country Nigeria. And so there's always this notion, well, there are too many. Yeah, there are too many, which is fantastic but they also do what they need to do. And when they come, I think Odun said earlier that you go to, uh, your parents tell you, go to school. I think it's the story of Nigerians. Okay, you got your bachelor's. Now I want you to go get your master's and then go, you'll get your doctors. Um, and that has been, um, I think, a generational and it's fantastic because I think it makes me proud 
to know that there is a high level, a highly educated community from the continent. And of course, uh, the majority happens to be Nigerians. And that's actually right. It should be because the number, as I said, is much larger. And, and so I think what we do with whether we come, the complexity that I'm trying to share is that when you are focused on one country, let's say in this, for example, at the Ni Nigerian diaspora, you have a much easier way of probably relatively easier, and I shouldn't say easy, but relatively easier than talking about 54, 55 countries. ADN does 54, 55 countries purposely, because I do believe that because I am an Eritrean, there is no reason why I shouldn't be able to invest in Kenya, in Ghana, in other places around the, the, the continent, the same in, in, in Nigeria, and that whole intra-diaspora collaboration, intra-diaspora uh, uh, investment. This is critical. This is what's going to take Africa into a different place. So if you look at what was happening 30 years ago, there was this notion of me or nobody, um, and that we have seen it, and it sometimes it perpetuates. But I think it's to our failure, simply because we haven't captured the imagination of the other people who are in need of being a part of this big picture. And I think that goes back again to the value creation. Entrepreneurship at its core, as he said, is about whether you are able to create value uh, that is going to be useful to the community, even if in business, if you don't have something that I want, I'm not going to buy from you. So your entrepreneurship, regardless of what you think about yourself, doesn't mean anything. But if we can continue to think about why are we doing this, and then if we know the reason is not only to make a difference in yourself as a human being, in your family, but also in the community, I think it's better not to start it. Simply because somebody else does it, it doesn't mean it makes it right for you to start. The last thing I want to say about this is, not all of us are made entrepreneurs. I cannot be you and nor can you be me, but you can be unique you and provide that value that you can provide to the community if you focus on what it is that your core competency that you can share. Because I think one of the drawback um, in what I see is happening and I think um, others can um, attest to this is that because uh, Oduni is doing something, let me go ahead and do something like her. And what's the problem with that is that because I don't have her skill, the chances of me failing is pretty high. Instead, if I could say, this is all I know, let me bring other people to help me because they have much different knowledge and expertise and enlarge that pie because the pie is as big as we want to cut it. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger if we refuse to be on the scarcity model, but be on the abundance model. It's how you cut the piece and the piece can be cut to make sure that it's a, uh, it will feed all of us. And that kind of thinking is something that's necessary, whether in, under, in business entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, in other things that we do, it is very important we think about the bigger community that we believe we want to serve rather than just this is about me. Every time, I can't talk about other people, but about myself. Every time that I told something was about me, I failed. Uh, simply because actually it didn't mean anything. I, I was not really necessarily to the, this is, to the subject. Actually, it was the bigger ecosystem that was more important. And I made it uh, my personal uh, journey to make sure that the very people who make a difference in our organization need to be shout out, amplify them, because I don't think that what we do at ADN, supporting the uh, grassroots entrepreneurs through the builders of Africa's future, where we bring them to the valley, I don't do it alone. There are so many, 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 many people starting from the funders to the champions that make things happen. The same thing with the accelerating black leadership and entrepreneurship that we've started. That has a huge ecosystem in itself. So the only way you can make something happen is if your value can align with the community that is in need of it, that might really make a big difference in the community. For our continent, I always say, no matter what I do, no matter where I go, it pulls you in. And that's why we really do what we need to do to help the continent. But I still think there is an opportunity for all of us collectively to work. And then I think share, share resources, share opportunities, because even if I give you something today, you won't be able to use it as much as I think you will use it simply because I don't think you will be able to do something bad with it. But if it can help you to progress what you're doing, 
I should be open to that and I should be generous enough to share it. Otherwise, knowledge that is not shared or resource that's not shared is not enough. That's really my take. Um, whether it was 30 years ago or today, that fundamental value creation continues to stay and I hope it stays for as long as possible. Thank you very much. One of the things that has been consistent across everybody's feedback is around mindset, is around value, shared value, um, around culture. And so, Odu, the, the challenge in this conversation sometimes is that people feel it's a zero-sum game. You know, if you look at where we are right now, and if I even speak maybe much more specifically to, um, to Nigeria, um, once Alma said something about everybody should always feel that, you know, they, they have, if you look at a whole pie, you can always, you should always feel that, you know, I can take a pie, but still leave quite a lot for everybody else. Um, but that's the reverse um, to some extent, not everybody thinks like that, but a lot of people also feel that if I don't grab everything, there probably be, be nothing for me to take later on. So how do we now create the next generation of wealth creators that have, shared values, um, shared purpose, um, who believe and who contribute to the good of all, um, despite the environment, despite the, despite everything and the climate we are in. Right, um, I think that it's a combination of many things. Um, the first one would be that I don't think that we can continue to do things despite the environment. I mean, we don't have much of a choice, but we will have to get to a point where we realize that the environment, the factors, these are all very big things when it comes to the, the kinds of people that our system kind of puts out, right? So um, how, do we, how do we build the next generation of like, you know, value synthesizers? One would be, like what are we what are we teaching to them? And we already talked extensively about the educational aspect. The second thing would be documentation. Like Inye rightly said, a lot of our history is lost because it's just not recorded, right? If you want to talk about Silicon Valley in the '90s, you could Google it, and you know the results come out. You know exactly what was going on. You know how like the dot com bubble was. You know how it burst. You know how we saw like the rise of the new age companies. Those stories are just not there for Nigerians. Our ecosystem is still very young, but this is actually the time that, it's, it's, that we write these stories for the next generation of people, especially when it comes to representation, right? Um, when you do Google Nigerian entrepreneurs, you will see a lot of times eight men, two women. Very soon, as, as history tends to do, the participation of the women will get erased. If there's no good documentation, every generation is doomed to start all over, right? Almost like there's no history. So how do you tell them how Andela was built, how Florida Wave was built, how Paystack was built, how they catalyzed capital for the entire ecosystem? We need to be able to put together that research, write down our own history, document it, so that the next generation isn't starting again. They're not building their own blueprint there's already an existing blueprint. And the third thing I suppose would be um, from the point of view of, if you've been able to do this successfully, it's your responsibility, whether you like it or not, to kind of hold the door open for the next generation so they have it a bit easier and they don't have to go through the struggles that you went through, right? It's like, what are the aspects of like running a tech startup or being an entrepreneur, fundraising? In 2013, fundraising is, was um, unarguably harder than it is today. We expect it to be easier in 2030. Who makes it easier in 2030? The entrepreneurs of today, right? So we all need to kind of hold the door open, shatter those barriers so that younger entrepreneurs are facing new and fit like kinds of challenges, not the base of fundamental challenges that we currently face. And lastly, the social like environment, whether we like it or not, the government uh, and like other like um, regulated sectors all have a role to play in creating and enabling creative environment for entrepreneurs. You definitely don't want your own entrepreneurs 
eight years, nine years, 10 years down the line, still struggling with infrastructural challenges when the rest of the world has moved on to very new, very innovative like tech problems, right? A lot of the sentiment that we typically express today is that like Nigerian entrepreneurs are very creative. We have a lot of grit, we have a lot of hustle, but a lot of that is channeled towards solving problems that we shouldn't be solving, right? You create your own electricity, you create your own safety, you create your own transport. We don't want those challenges to linger for the next generation. They shouldn't because creativity and hustle and grit is best spent solving the problem for the next million, um, the next 100 million Nigerians. For instance, Nigeria is projected to have the, to be the most populous nation in the world, right, by 2050. Being the most populous nation in the world comes with its own unique set of challenges. Infrastructure should not be one of them so that, you know, like entrepreneurs are able to get to work and create like, all these solutions. Like in, in developed worlds today, we have companies creating actual cities, right? In Nigeria, that's hard to do. I know someone is trying to do it and they're doing a very great foundational job, but how is it that we create like all of this enabling oasis for young people to be able to create, to work, and they don't have to think of like problems that their counterparts don't have to. When you present to foreign investors, right, the difference in the kind of problems that we face and the kind of problems that foreign like startup um, founders face, is never like more apparent than then. So we need to be able to not just like educate them, you know, we need to be able to educate them. We need to be able to hold open the door for them to be able to move in like and learn. We need to be able to create an enabling environment for them because if there is anything that the next generation deserves is to have an environment where they can create because it's they're the future, the right? And we're all hurting towards a future that's uncertain. We should be doing everything in our part to make it easier for the people coming after us. So I'll do another quick one. Speaking of making it easier, um, um, one of the things you co-founded recently is First Check Africa. Why is that important in terms of building generational wealth? Right. Um, so uh, as a female entrepreneur myself, uh, I started this entrepreneurship journey in 2013. And I was, I'm one of the lucky ones because when I started, I had a lot of supporters, right? He is one of them, right? So every time we had to do something, we got luckier than most. We met our first investor in 2014 and he's been our investor for the past seven years. I had my parents tell me, you don't have to do this if you don't want to, but you can do whatever you want to do. When I said I wanted to study engineering, there was no argument as to whether I could or not. I absolutely could. And even graduating and coming out to tell them, yeah, I'm going to run my own company. There was resistance, but it wasn't the kind of resistance where you think you don't do this kind of things because you're a woman. Unfortunately, not many women are that lucky, right? Raising funds is at least, I think it's about, I don't know, 10 times or more harder for women than it is for men. I've seen it, I've gone through it. Even though I came out the other side raising money, what I realized during like doing research is the $1 million fundraising mark is almost attainable for black women across the world. The number of black women in the world who raise $100 million is still in the hundreds. It's not in the thousands, it's not in the millions. There's millions of black women in, in the world. Coming back home, what I've seen is that the Nigerian founders, right, we're getting funding like better and easier than we used to in the past. But what you were like, what we don't know is that the pipeline starts off being a bit wider and then it narrows as you go to the top. And by the time you get to the top, almost all the women are filtered out just because it's too hard. No one is giving them the kind of money that they'll give. A lot of the fundraising in Nigeria right now is still very bro -y, where like people are meeting over beer and they're like, you know, agreeing these deals, places that women typically aren't. Like I, I don't go out drinking a lot. Many women don't. And so having been through that and living that and understanding that if we don't 
like do something about the number of women participating. There is a lot of conditioning that's gone into where we, where we are today, where you don't see as many women visible. Something has to be done. If not, women will lose out in the next like tech revolution as it comes to Nigeria and Africa as a whole. So my partner and I decided that we would put together our own funds and start to look for women-led companies and diverse companies and give them money very early in the entrepreneurship journey, which is basically, we are your first, like, um, we, we are giving you the first money you'll ever get, build. And so we started that in January and we've written five checks so far and there's more coming. And we're seeing these women going on to build, going on to raise follow-on funding and generally being able to play uh, on a more, I think slightly more level playing field as the male counterparts. That's why. So like, there isn't like a big aha moment in that way. Um, what we've seen is I'm a woman, I've been through it. I see women going through it every day. I should be on my own side. I should be making it easier for women after me. And, and that's why I first check. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and thank you for the work you're doing. Um, e, I don't know if you're still with us here. I am. Okay, I am yes, you are. Okay, great. Yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. So one more, one last question before the Q&A. Um, so what would you tell to young, young, young Nigerians, young, young Africans, you know, young people who think that the world is a much more harder place for them now, uh, who think, you know, there's just almost like, there are a lot of good news and spotlights, but it just seems increasingly more difficult uh, with insecurity and so many of the challenges that we're having. What would you tell a young person with a great idea who is also looking to intentionally um, really harness their, their dreams and, and really build something, not just for themselves and their communities. They want to do this, but you know, they feel that the pressure of the environment is, is really against them. Sure. Um, um, thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, first of all, I, I do want to apologize because I, I wouldn't be able to join you for the q and I, I have to run to the team meeting. Okay. But um, I think the one, the one thing I would say on this question is, um, I think it's really important for young people to um, to try to dedicate themselves to some sort of larger goal or service, right? Um, because it helps to keep you very focused on on impact, right? I find that a lot of young people are very um, distracted by success porn, right? By um, all sorts of um, unnecessary um, standards that are being set for them. Um, by their parents, by society, and what it takes to be great in the world that we live in is to really just dedicate yourself to an idea or a mission relentlessly, right? And, and build come what may. Um, it's never going to get easier. The society is going to get far more distracting than it is today. So if your hope is that it's going to get better, pro probably not. And there are going to be a lot more excuses for not being able to build um, um, in, in, in society. But if you're a young person and you dedicate yourself to some sort of higher mission, you're, you can avoid those distractions. Um, and ultimately, you know, the really interesting thing is when you think that way, success is not usually very far from you. Um, but, but if you let the distractions in, if you're not, if you're reading the room too much, <laughs> um, you're, you're going to end up distracted by, by all these worldly concerns. And at the end of the day, you're going to end up an average person. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, Thank you. thanks again to our guests. Um, I think we'll move to the Q&A. Uh, we just probably have about five to seven minutes. Um, I'm sure Liz will keep me in check for that. The, we have two questions, and um, the first one is to Almaz. Um, Almaz, did you face additional entrepreneurship challenges as a woman, and how did you navigate through them? Um, again, please, just a reminder to everyone who wants to ask questions, please do put your questions within the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screens. And, and also, if you want it to be answered by someone in particular, Please, uh, please do direct it uh, to them in your question. So please, over to you, Albert. 
Thank you. That's a very important question. I think Odun just mentioned about how hard it is for women to get funding. When we, she was talking about that, I realized in the United States, less than 1% of the VC money goes to African uh, entrepreneurs, Black entrepreneurs, I should say. And then of that, even much, much less money comes to women entrepreneurs. So you can imagine uh, that what took ADN to accelerate uh, probably five to eight years would have been much easier if that organization was led by someone who doesn't look like me. That is just the reality too, you know, um, uh, as much as I uh, do not want to give power to uh, the marginalization that we all face, you know, when you're in Nigeria, you're in Nigeria, it's your home. Uh, when I'm in Eritrea, I'm in my country and my color is as beautiful as anybody else. So I don't have to answer to anyone what I look like. That is who I am. Um, and I think one of the things that we have advantage over other people, yes, I did face challenges, but I will also say this. My challenge is minuscule to the challenge that African-Americans have faced. This is the historical diaspora the diaspora that has suffered for me to thrive. Um, I am on the back of, and many of us from the diaspora, we should know this, we are on the back, uh, we're walking on the back and the shoulders of African-Americans who sacrifice for us. So the challenges for that community, in my opinion, is actually much harder than those of us who are the contemporary diaspora, the new immigrants. Still though, nonetheless, a challenge is a challenge Yes, I did face challenges. And I think the first one comes from societal challenge. That's my macro at some level, the huge, it's beyond me. Some of it is micro within our own community. So we have an issue of uh, second guessing each other, not really lifting up each other, uh, but I am good at uh, diffusing these noises and keep focusing on what needs to be done. So I have always focused on what is big and what's important, what's necessary, and really just put away these uh, unnecessarily noises um, that can actually distract you from your focus. So you, I, I've always really just put my head down and said, what is the big picture that I'm trying to achieve and why not just put all my resources, my energy in there? Because I think the rest of it could be very challenging. But yes, as a woman, uh, you do get challenged, not just as a woman, think about me. I am a woman with an accent from Eritrea, a mother, and traditionally, culturally, all of those things do become a burden if we want to make them a burden. Um, and I think what, I, what we need to do as women is mitigate that by really having to work with women who are supporting women, with men, who are supporting women um, and with everyone who is interested and has um, aligned with your shared value. And again, at the end of the day, um, regardless of the challenge, as I said earlier, if the value that you create is aligned with the very people who probably even just didn't think you were gonna go anywhere, your chances of bringing them to the table is much, much higher. So in a way it's an opportunity rather than a challenge, but yes, as a woman, I do face, and I'm very grateful for those challenges as well. Thank you, Omar. Uh, the next question I'll direct it to you, Odo. It's from Yemisi Ransom Kuti. At a personal level, how can the older generation best engage with young folks to empower them at the social and economic levels? Very interesting question. Um, I think that's one of the ways that I've always spoken about is that both sides of the table kind of need to speak to each other more and listen to each other more. I think that there is a gap in lifestyle understanding and there's no way to kind of bridge it except people are listening more. Um, older people don't understand young people. They don't understand the lifestyle and they don't understand our choices, but Younger people also don't know the experiences that have shaped older people uh, and inform the kind of choices that they make. And this goes back into us not documenting our history. So that way, there's 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 a like there's a knowledge gap that no one is really like working to be and to bridge. And so you know you have the millennial generation and the Gen Z generation, and then you have the Gen X and the boomers who are traditionally more conservative. And they're more conservative because they've been through experiences that make them conservative. We're more liberal. 
because we're living in a world that allows us to be. And if we're not listening to each other's points of views, I don't think it's going to work, right? And it's not just listening like we're sitting down and exchanging ideas. It's listening like, um, for instance, a, a, a great way to kind of illustrate this is what's going on with regulators and fintech startups in Nigeria. Both sides are trying to build to their own like uh, points in Nigeria that works and going about it in ways that they'd say are different. But I'd say are much the same because you have the same goals, but there has been no solid stakeholder engagement in a way that helps kind of, you know, how do you make this person understand that we might be going about it differently, but we're trying to get to the same destination. So there needs to be more stakeholder engagement, whether you're FinTech, FMCG, um, non-governmental organization work, whatever. There needs to be a bit more presence and a mix of intergenerational presence, actually, across all of these things. Like we're sat here, we're in a, um, a memorial lecture for Olusha um, Gwagagu, who I heard his name before, but I had to research when I was invited to this panel. So that's kind of like, that's the kind of knowledge transfer that you want, where young people are participating in all of these traditions and older people are being brought, um, as it were, into our own present to understand why we do what we do. Thank you very much. So con con find platforms that provide opportunities for conversion, convergence, shared understanding and, and dialogue. Um, your, your initial ex example made me remember this Yoruba proverb, um, so for non-Yoruba speakers, loosely translated to a younger person may have more clothes than an older person, but they would probably never uh, have as much, uh, for what a better word, rags to that. So thank you. Um, so last two questions, Almaz, um, I'll, I'll go to you with this one. Um, how do how does one go about building and well rather even preserving wealth for future generations? Um, one of the things, and again, you know, our history is still is still very new, so to speak. And so even when we look at uh, maybe look at other examples in other parts of the world, um, there, there are people who 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 are benefiting from wealth that was created 100 years, 200 years ago, and all of that. So how do we start on that path or, or build on that path? What are some of like the practical examples you would give uh, for, to do that? Thank you. Creating generational wealth. I thought I didn't hear the first one, generational wealth. Yeah, so how does one preserve wealth for the next generation? Um, yeah. So beyond just now, but then for the future. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. So I'm going to use the example of the diaspora. And so in this case will be our Nigerian diaspora, Ghanaian diaspora, all of us. So when you come as a diaspora, uh, as an immigrant, you start from zero. You have nowhere to go but up. And so that's one of the reasons now you can see that uh, in the example of Nigerians, since we're talking about Nigeria, uh, in the United States, there are about uh, 392 393,000 who consider themselves Nigeria as their birthplace. And so that's like a, um, uh, the immigrant community. And then if you look at that number, 61% of the Nigerians, this is incredible. I, I need to share this number. 61%, this comes from the migration policy and I'll be happy to share that with Liz later. 61% of Nigerian Americans over the age of 25 hold graduate degree compared to 32% of US, US population. Think about that. If you are at that level, your chances of creating generational wealth begins in the United States and in many countries. I think we are ownership society by owning house, uh, making sure that the, uh, the, the debt in the house is paid. And then you're sending your children to college. Education is at its core the greatest foundation that we have as diasporans. We've been told when we were let go of the home that we knew from our own home country to go to school to better yourself. So the way in which I have seen sustainable, uh, there are other means people do this, but the sustainable generational wealth that you create that stays for 
for years and years to come, as others have done it in the past, I have to give credit to the diaspora, especially the African diaspora in the United States. I can only talk about where I am is incredible. At that level, you've got Nigerian um, at the highest level in terms of numbers. And then you've got Ghanaians and Kenyans and Eritreans and Ethiopians have done incredibly well to create that generational wealth. And last thing I want to say, one of the biggest problem we have in the United States is um, uh, uh, college debt. And so if you talk to a diasporan, uh, one of the things we do, and this is just our credo, uh, we make sure that our kids, not all of us, most of us, we make sure that our kids, when they get out of college, they have absolutely no debt. Why do we do that? That's a part of generational wealth creation. Because if you, if you let me out, if I let my son out with debt, I do know it will take him or my daughter a long time to create that wealth. So I think there are fundamental things we do, but number one is uh, education for us, for diasporans, it works because that's the only thing we could do when we come. I shouldn't say the only thing, people have gotten wealth with many different things. But those of us who chose to go through uh, the education uh, system, we have done well for ourselves. Again, it's not equal, but it shows in the number that I shared with you, that sheer number that you've got more Nigerians with a higher degree than Americans themselves, it's just an incredible number. That I think is the beginning of the sustainable, the long-term generational wealth that we will continue to create for our community, for our family, for our community, and for generations to come. Thank you very much, Almaz. And I think that's the perfect way for us to end, to end this conversation. Thank you to yourself, to Odo and to E for really speaking to the topic and um, the perspective you provided. We full circled back to education the role of education, but not just education within the four walls of a classroom, but just education that helps you to open your mind, open your thinking, appreciate the opportunities that are there. Um, with that, you've talked, one of the things you've sort of talked about, Almaz, is even around financial literacy and how do you, because you can be educated, but also not be wealthy and all of that. So how do you translate that? We've talked about the role of shared value and common value. So the good for one is the good for all and good for all is good for one. Um, Odu talked a lot around creating bridges um, across generations and not just maybe from like much older people to much younger people, but even across like um, even the, the different generations that we've had creating platforms to hear different sides because there's value on different sides and there's perspectives to different sides and finding a way for shared shared conversation like what we're having um, today again. Um, you've all emphasized the role of entrepreneurship, the importance of building communities that connect with capital, connect with resources, connect with information, and that the entrepreneurship is expressed in different ways. You know, and entrepreneurship is not just a singular journey, but it's a journey that is also gone through together. And you've also inspired us, right, that the, regardless of how gloomy it may look, this really is the time for entrepreneurs, you know, um, and, and, and there's so many opportunities, there's so many resources also available. Um, and, and Odu and Almaz in particular also talked about the importance of also uh, providing that additional support for women who make half of the population, but also are even significantly also impacted and, and affected even in this conversation. So thanks again to the, uh, to the Agago family for, for bringing us to this conversation. Thank you for the work that you do and for and, and to all our speakers and panelists. Thank you very much. Over to you, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. What a wonderful panel um, with so much information. Um, thank you, Almaz, Odun, uh, Nike for for sharing all of this wealth with us. Uh, your, the information is wealth, uh, knowledge is power. And I definitely learned so much uh, from this discussion. We also do have other questions that did get asked. We appreciate those. We'll make sure to save these and we'll make sure to incorporate those in, um, in some future communications and get those questions answered. So, um, yes. Okay, so next up on our agenda, um, is a brief video. So I know we've been talking about the foundation, we've been talking about the impact, and we felt it was really important this year to share some of those stories directly from uh, those 
who have uh, benefited from this work. So bear with me for just one minute while I share my screen and we're going to watch a video about uh, the beneficiaries. One second. So, oh, this scholarship has really been a great benefit to me because um, some students would think, oh, it's not possible for them to actually like get into university on time after their O level and all. But I got this scholarship immediately after my O level, and it's really a great opportunity to me. I'm really thankful. My name is Aikuta Priscilla Messi. It has been really helpful, actually. It has lifted a very huge burden for my parents. Because I'm not the only child they give birth to. We are four. And the fact that they didn't have to pay my school fees, they had to like, focus on my many siblings and take care of them. It was really helpful. Yeah, I benefited from Moluche Gwakagu Foundation scholarship that was 2015, precisely. Well, this scholarship opportunity have really been a benefit to me and it's a timely decision. It came at the right time because I was about to further my academics then and this opportunity came. So I can say I'm the one of the pioneer, the first people to benefit from this and this has really give me necessary and pedestrian to see a lot of opportunities here from electric the scholarship helped me a lot. When I started at 15, when I get there, I got the scholarship. I'm very happy because I, in my family, I don't, I don't think someone that has got the scholarship in my family. And I make sure that I'm very focused on that so that I will not switch my family and the from the commission I came So I'm very happy when I got the scholarship. And the scholarship really helped me. Because the scholarship cover is a full scholarship. It covers tuition fees, feeding, and I've put accommodation every for four years. My name is Fasha Weanuluapo. I'm a student of Alayuke University. I'm a 500 level nursing student. And I want to appreciate um, Olusha Gagagun Scholarship Foundation, most especially the family of Dr. Late Dr. Olusha Gagagun, for their um, support throughout this my course of study because I believe it is if it is no God and them, this will be possible. I really appreciate what they have done because paying a huge amount of money to sponsor my school fees is not easy. And relieving my parents from the stress of paying school fees is not easy. On behalf of me and my family, I say thank you, sir. Thank you, Mama, for what you have done. Really, I'm a more follower. My course of study in university is computer science, Adelaide University to be precise. Um, from I'm in 300 level already. So my 100 level and 200 level, the total cost should be around 1.4 million. And the remaining cost should be under 1.4 million. So I think everything should be 2.8 million. So um, my thanks to the school and foundation scholarship. I want to appreciate them because it's a privilege for me to be one of the beneficiaries and I'm very grateful. My family is grateful and everybody with me is grateful. Thank you. If it's and the scholarship foundation has helped a lot of people, those who are from um, um, pop and um, background. So it helps a lot of people that want to go to the university but do not have money. But through the scholarship foundation, the Lucia Guaragu Scholarship Foundation, a lot of people uh, a lot of people have been there. They've been in the university to acquire knowledge and to graduate from the school to have better jobs and everything. So I really want to thank um, Olusha Garamuko and Foundation to uh, God will continue to strengthen them and to provide for them because it's not easy to be in that school to pay a huge amount of money and God will continue to bless them in Jesus' name. I graduated with 4.47 out of 5.0 CGP on second class of a Yes, the second class of a a 4.21 is seven classes. A lot of us actually, because what they've done, they've really done great thing. Because if I remember the story behind me getting this um, scholarship, ah, 
but I thank God for everything and I'm very grateful to them. I'm very, very grateful. And may God continue to bless them. You know, I'll thank um, my foundation for giving me this opportunity. Because I never expected that. Um, I'm so grateful to bless them and them and guide them to this kind of opportunity for God. I really thank God for the opportunity given to me i really thank god i don't i don't know how to say it because i pray that the lord will, will continue to bless them and will support them in all their needs in jesus name i thank the foundation for contributing their own quarter to my secondary school education i'm grateful my name is seri kizena but um, I want to appreciate the what Agadu Foundation have really, have really done to, for us, the cash you are all giving to us. God will continue to be with you people. God will guide them. God will can grant them their wish. I hope everybody enjoyed hearing from the, the mouths of those that this foundation has touched. Um, actually, in the Q&A, um, there was actually a question for uh, you, the family, the Agagu family, um, and I'm going to ask it, and then I'm going to pass it on to you, uh, Shalape, to answer. So how do members of the family cope with the delightful burden of inheriting the legacy of their great father? Um, thank you, uh, Yemisi Ransom Kuti, for this question. Um, please, uh, Ms. Shalapi Agagu Hammond, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you very much, Liz. I think that truly is an apt question, and it segues very nicely to my section. Uh, so, my dearest aunt, uh, Ms. YRK, thank you for that question. The answer is the way we do it is with all of you. It's with what we're doing here. It's with the support that we've seen. Um, I know that maybe a lot of our donors are anonymous, uh, but we have a lot of people who are supporting the incredible work that the foundation is doing. And that really is the only way. Um, you know, again, I love what uh, Ms. Negash of uh, ADN said. There are just certain things that are fundamental and you're built a certain way and we have no other choice. But the reasons why we do it have just been shown. Uh, so without further ado, I think I'll segue that to the thanks because as I said, it's really on every, it's on everyone and everything that everyone has done to support us over the last eight years that we have been able to keep this work going. Um, it's what he started before he passed uh, for his 60th birthday and every year after that until he passed at the age of 65. Uh, he gave cash prizes and set, started these awards which we have continued and then expanded. And so we've been inspired by a great man and we've been supported by you know, just the wonderful friends and family and uh, partners really that have then enabled us to continue this work. So I'll start my thanks with the amazing panel that we had today, the amazing Almaz Nagash, thank you so very much. The fantastic Inya Boyeji, he's off now, but I'll reach out to him later. The wonderful Odwe Weli, just absolutely love you and your candor. And of course, the incomparable Kompe, my wonderful sister, Adenike Adariemi. Thank you so very much for the amazing work, uh, the amazing, just amazing time you shared with us today. Great insight. <laughs> I don't know if you saw us, but at least this is a summary of you know, our feelings about the wonderful work of the panel. You truly spoke to the heart of entrepreneurship. And we could already see, even in that room, many people touching each other. And that really is the spirit of it. That is how we create value. And I think my biggest takeaway was be grateful for your challenges. I certainly am grateful for mine because they're what shape us to be who we are. Um, the next would be the board of the Odisha Gwandago Foundation. We thank you so very much chairman. for the wonderful support, uh, starting from the chairman, our own Dr. Adele Janeleke, who was such a wonderful brother to my father and has continued to remain so to the whole family, uh, all the members of the board, uh, excluding the secretary, my brother Faye. Thank you to everyone else. <laughs> thank you just so much for all the incredible ideas and the execution over the past eight years. I know Papa would be so proud and so humbled by all that you've done uh, for him and for his family since his passing. Uh, 
our donors. Without this, we, without you, we couldn't do any of this. And you know, we don't very often. I'm sure most people have noticed that hardly ever a call for donations really, because most people just come. People even reach out. Oh, the fund, the September 13 is coming. Send me that account number again. We thank you so very much. But this year, I'm going to reach out. <laughs> <laughs> Please donate. We have some incredible new um, uh, things that we want to do. We want to continue to expand. We've moved from three universities now to six. Uh, we've increased the number of secondary schools, and and we're doing under. We're doing. We started. We're doing um, primary school, secondary school, university. We're looking to move to masters and do do, do some things to support entrepreneurship. Uh, there's so many other things Shepard that we intend to do. The Odisha Gago University that's making wins every day. And I think our uh, vice chancellor, Professor Adesha Modri, is online. Thank you. Chairman. Chairman, sorry. Chairman, sorry. Chairman of, uh, of the Board of uh, Governors of the University. Thank you so much for all the great work that you're doing. So we shall be coming to you all for our donations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to our alumni, you make our hearts so, so proud. You make our hearts sing. Uh, it's always a tough time in September, but every time I watch that video, it just made me. I'm really, really uh, excited because really, truly, um, it's about touching lives and we're very happy that you made us so proud. I'm hearing how everyone's doing so well and graduating at the top of their class. Uh, please continue to just um, remain motivated and you also paid for to leave the world better than we met it. Um, to our friends and family, uh, you know, I'm sure people saw me, I've been jumping up so excitedly every time I see a new name, so I've jumped up about 200 times today. Um, thank you so very much for always, always supporting. For people who are new, maybe this is your first time, you know, welcome to the family, the Memorial Lecture family. Uh, we hope that you had a wonderful time, you've taken something from it, and that you will also go on to leave the world better than you, than you, than you met it. And to my wonderful family, my beautiful, always elegant mother, thank you so much for everything that you are. You are my father's role model. He told me that himself, so you can't deny it. <laughs> so thank you very much to all that you do for holding us together. Uh, to my siblings, my wonderful siblings, all of you here, Feiyi, uh, Bisoye, um, Momi, Femi, and of course my husband Brian and I, thank you so much to all my father's siblings. I see you all online on Sunday, on Kuhuwa, everybody's online. My mom's siblings, we're all a family. Thank you very much to the family, my cousins. So every, I'm going to get into trouble if I do this the group. So I'm just going to say thank you so much to everyone, all the members of the family. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of the day. I think we have some highlights for you as we have to. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and God bless you. Thank you so much. Um, it's it's so you know I never had the the blessing to to meet your father, but I feel like I have because just the, the spirit that you all embody, um, and the work that you're doing to keep him alive through this work is really 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 humbling. It's really inspiring. Um, I'm honored to be a part of it. I know my team is honored to be a part of it. And um, let me just say to everyone on this call, please make a donation. Please make a donation. I want to hear, yes, please, 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 and thank you. Um, yes, they may not ask, but with every donation that you give, you, you're allowing them to continue this beautiful legacy and to support the next generation, getting the, getting the education that they need is the most important thing. Um, so thank you. I see how much, you know, how much this family uh, has touched the lives of others. Let's help them out. Uh, everybody take out your, your, your checkbooks, just take out your, your, your bank accounts and just send something. Uh, it would be very, very helpful. So Thank you all uh, for joining us today. Um, what we will do now, I guess, is the tradition of our online memorial lecture is some is to close it out with some high life. So yeah, to, uh, please enjoy. Uh, this is the Agagu family playlist on Spotify. So if you have Spotify, we can even share it with you. So thank you so much uh, to everyone. Uh, and uh, we wish you a good rest of your evening. Uh-oh, they're dancing now. We see you. Hey.
Thank you. 